there is a general awakening in our world. And why wouldn't there be with all of these crises looming? We are facing a health crisis, as well as an economic and social crisis with no parallel in the history of the United Nations. The seeds for further social and political unrest are being sown and we are already seeing COVID-19's unequal impacts intertwine with long-standing injustices, including racism. I think we should have a lot of optimism that when you see how fast the world can change, when you clearly articulate a purpose, when there's a lot at stake, In order to overcome the death, economic plight, and damage to the social fabric of our societies, we must work together to achieve resilience. Out of the ashes of the COVID-19 pandemic, let us first have the courage to recover as a better world. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, wherever you may be. Today, at this high-level event, we are coming together to take stock and exchange experiences learned from COVID's impact on our health, our economy, and society. More importantly, we come together to look at a collective future, a healthier, sustainable, and more equitable future for all. Indeed, COVID-19 is a wake-up call for humanity as one. We need to rethink what we invest and how we operate today, as it determines where we and generations to come will all end up. It is in the interest of every country, every individual and every business to make the right and smart choice now. As the world's largest corporate sustainability initiative, the United Nations Global Compact is calling on business leaders everywhere to unite to support workers communities and companies affected by the COVID-19 pandemic to minimize the short-term drawback and losses. At the same time, we are guiding and supporting companies everywhere to take a principle-based approach to recover better and to recover stronger and to maximize the long-term sustainable development dividends and accelerate the sustainable development goals. Over the past decades, healthcare outcomes have steadily improved across the world. However, significant gaps still exist within and between countries. And while healthcare infrastructure is a concern everywhere, the greatest needs are in developing countries, including the many countries engaged in the Belt and Road Initiative. Today, spurred on by the pandemic, we can bridge global gaps in healthcare infrastructure by leveraging the initiative's existing projects as well as the plans that are still on the drawing board. Indeed, as the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres recently said, greater international cooperation is urgently needed to support developing countries. We need to make the connection between health and healthcare needs and social, economic, and environmental well being. More than ever, the need to build future oriented, more sustainable, and a resilient healthcare infrastructure is top of the to-do list. This will require effective collaboration and robust financing. To pave the way for the world we all want tomorrow, businesses have to make the right investments today. Businesses can work together, invest responsibly, and deliver solutions to pressing healthcare challenges and address the needs of the most vulnerable in our society, complementing government's efforts. 
businesses can provide much needed innovations in technology, services and products, all in a responsible manner and aligned with the 10 principles of the United Nations Global Compact. When businesses consider their full range of impact and take a principles-based approach to the global goals, they will see opportunities for growth and innovation based on the world's greatest needs. Collaboration has been crucial in the global response to COVID-19, with stakeholders from different sectors and countries sharing information, best practices, coordinated medical supplies, and engaging in joint research and development for vaccines and medicines. Businesses have supported each other to face the challenges. Indeed, such collaboration should continue and should be strengthened as no single country, no single stakeholder can win the hard battle alone and face the challenges that lie ahead of us. If we succeed, we will come to remember our current difficulties as a distant crisis that was a turning point for global progress. Representing the United Nations Global Compact, I look forward to working with all companies, governments, and all stakeholders to unite together for building a healthier and more sustainable future where nobody will be left behind. Thank you. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great honor and pleasure uh, to be invited to contribute uh, as a speaker uh, to this uh, meeting, conference on building sustainable and resilient healthcare infrastructure to accelerate the SDGs and Agenda 2063. And I would like to thank the UN Global Compact, not only for what they are doing in the implementation of Agenda 2030, but also in maintaining alive uh, a spirit of commitment of a private sector towards social development. So my presentation will mainly focus on, on five points. Uh, the first one is about uh, uh, the quality of our health infrastructure systems. Uh, the pandemic, COVID-19, has shaken what we could call the foundations and characteristics of our health systems uh, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of uh, staff training, in terms of uh, the speed of the responses. And it has been all over the world. Uh, the pandemic has caused the lockdown of more than half of the uh, human population on Earth. And it has shown also that rich and poor countries had to face the same challenge. And let me give an example. Africa with one billion 300 million inhabitants has had the same number of deaths, 30,000 something, as New York has. So normally uh, you would expect uh, New York to have uh, the perfect infrastructure, uh, uh, the staff uh, and the systems in order to cope with this pandemic. And you would expect Africa which has uh, the highest number of low-income countries uh, not to be able to face uh, such pandemic. So we need to investigate and look behind uh, uh, the concept of resilience, what has made uh, these different systems respond uh, in terms of efficacy or or efficiency. So all our systems have been tested and uh, we should draw the necessary lessons of the way they have been tested. My, my second point is about the vulnerabilities that we have seen. I, I'm not convinced that the vulnerabilities have fundamentally been at the level of the infrastructure, re, health infrastructure systems. I'm profoundly convinced 
but uh, the strongest or the most striking vulnerability has been at the level of the organization of our social systems. Uh, some social systems could coordinate well, uh, create synergies between actors in order to collectively provide solutions. And some social systems could not reach a level, an optimal level of organization and could not instill trust, confidence in their citizens. And instilling trust and confidence is evidently an issue of leadership. So there is a lesson on the social systems in terms of vulnerability, and there is a lesson in the quality of the leadership. Being mindful of the fact that uh, leadership is the capacity to install, to install trust and have people work together towards a commonly accepted solutions. Evidently, in uh, uh, the case of Africa, we faced uh, uh, severe vulnerabilities. 38% um, only of healthcare facilities have access to water. Uh, roughly the same percentage have access to energy. So the fact of not uh, having access to critical infrastructure uh, domains like water, like energy, did have a significant impact on the way we responded to the pandemic. Uh, fundamentally, uh, what did save somehow Africa from uh, the big numbers that we have seen elsewhere is that it was focused, the pandemic was essentially focused, as the WHO is telling us, in more in urban areas than in rural areas. And even if Africa has a high level of urbanization, we still have a majority of our population living in rural areas. And the median age, as you know, of Africa is around 19 uh, years old. The other vulnerability, which is important to, to mention, is uh, the fact that uh, uh, the way our states are organized is in a, a top-down manner. And uh, the pandemic revealed the importance of bringing the communities in uh, framing the diagnostic, accepting the diagnostic, and then looking after the solution and being part of the solution. So ownership is a, is a key uh, issue. And uh, uh, the systems which were more vulnerable than the others didn't realize uh, early enough that uh, ownership at community level was a critical factor of success in stopping uh, the spreading of a virus. So my third point is about the, the, the lessons. So we have three lessons to, to draw uh, from uh, uh, this pandemic. The first one is that resilience makes sense. It is not a theoretical concept. And uh, whatever we do in uh, infrastructure, we should make sure that the dimension of resilience is embedded in the design of our infrastructure projects, in the way we maintain our infrastructure projects, and in the way we connect the citizens to the use of this infrastructure, which have to be resilient. So what does a resilient infrastructure mean? It is an infrastructure which uh, allows the most vulnerable uh, to be able to use it in order to solve their critical issues regarding water, uh, regarding energy, uh, regarding access to internet. An infrastructure which is resilient allows access to it by the most vulnerable. 
And this is an important point. So we are not talking about big infrastructure projects and big corridors, which evidently we need to do about uh, rails, railways, uh, about uh, 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 mega uh, uh, dams. Uh, we are talking about the infrastructure which can alleviate poverty and which can increase the capacity of the citizens uh, to be autonomous. So this is a, the first lesson. The second lesson is uh, a, a lesson about integration. What we have learned is that health cannot be looked at as an isolated sector. It has to be linked to issues like energy, water, digital transformation. So by looking at uh, our solution in an integrated manner, it allows us to redefine the way we design our policies. And it reinforces one key characteristic of Agenda 2063 and Agenda 2030, which is about multi-sectorality. Solutions need to be framed on the basis of integration. The UN Global Compact has an important role to play. We have still um, private corporations who have not understood what sustainability means. Uh, luckily, we have an important number of corporations, private corporations, who have understood it. That minority needs to be expanded. And in expanding that minority, there is right now an opportunity to do so. And the role of the UN Global Compact is to maintain that passion, that capacity, that energy, that, ob that objective in order to <coughs> expand the community of a private sector, which is fundamentally committed to sustainable development. I thank you. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, greetings from Beijing, China. I would like to take this opportunity to offer my congratulations to the United Nations and the UN Global Compact on their 75th and 20th anniversaries, respectively. During this first ever online convening of the UN General Assembly Week, as we gather at the Uniting Business Life event, first, please join me to express deep condolences to those who lost their beloved ones and pay respect to health workers around the world who are saving lives in our collective efforts to combat the COVID-19 pandemic. As the region that was affected early by the pandemic, China and the Chinese people have made great sacrifices to contain the virus and played an indispensable and unparalleled role in safeguarding the lives and health of people around the world. As part of this enormous efforts, Chinese companies have worked collaboratively with the international communities and made great contributions to regional and global public health and accelerated the global economic recovery. People in many Chinese companies have made great sacrifices during this pandemic and they should not be forgotten. There are many touching stories that gave a human face to the global market, reflecting the founding philosophy of the UN Global Compact. China's state construction 
mobilized huge amount of manpower and material resources to build two hospitals with thousands of beds in just 10 days in order to save lives in Wuhan. The company also converted the Addis Ababa Silk Road Hospital into isolation wards within five days, supporting local anti-pandemic efforts in Ethiopia. And more hospitals have been built by Chinese companies in many other countries. These hospitals have greatly improved local public health infrastructure and played a substantial role in combating the pandemic across borders. China's Three Gorges Corporation helped laws when the country was in great shortage of personal protective equipment at the early stage of the pandemic. The company procured facial masks and other equipment to protect and train local employees and residents on pandemic prevention. At the Menmai number no. one terminal of the China Laos Railway, built by China Railway Construction Corporation, was held through despite the pandemic, which has helped to bolster the economic growth and improve people's lives in Laos. China Europe freight train transported anti-pandemic supplies, totaling about 4 million items, weighing 27,000 tons to the affected countries and regions during the first half of this year, making great contributions to the global fight against COVID-19. China Costco shipping has completed 640 million tons of goods in the first six months as part of Chinese companies' efforts to maintain the smooth functioning and security of international industrial chains, supply chains, and global logistics systems. Sinopharm has participated in international collaboration to accelerate the development of vaccine and medicines for COVID-19, committing to making its vaccine a global public goods. These are just a few examples of Chinese companies which have exerted every effort to combat COVID-19 at home and abroad. They are still going all out containing the pandemic. In the face of the pandemic and many global challenges today and those yet to come, the international community is one and should be united as one. Chinese companies stand for the vision of building a community with a shared future for mankind and contributing to a global community of health for all. Such commitments and actions will ultimately contribute to the achievement of the SDGs. They are at the forefront to protect lives, providing humanitarian assistance to safeguard the most fundamental human rights. They respond fast to the most urgent needs by coordinating and mobilizing experts and resources to support international anti-pandemic cooperation during crisis. They are responsible global corporate citizens contributing to restoring global supply chains and economic recovery by fully resuming work and production and continue to provide much needed supplies to countries and people wherever there is need.
Global crisis needs a global response. Only when we join forces in solidarity and cooperation can human society win the battle against the pandemic and recover better, stronger, and together. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, a healthier and sustainable future needs us to make the right investments and take actions today. Let's come together, uniting business and work as one, making concerted efforts to protect the life and the health of people on this planet, so that our world can recover to become a better place where people can breathe safely, move freely, and live happily. I am pleased that we launched the Action Platform on Sustainable Infrastructure for the Belt and Road Initiative to accelerate the SDGs in June, which aims to unite business and other stakeholders to advance 2030 Agenda and to foster such collaboration through research, capacity building, innovation, and technology for shared prosperity. I am deeply convinced that the mission of the United Nations, including the UN Global Compact and the inclusive multilateralism will get us through the crisis towards a sustainable future for all leaving no one behind. Thank you. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I had a distinct privilege of serving my country as foreign minister, as well as the world as the 67th president of the UN General Assembly. It is my pleasure to address you under these extraordinary circumstances as we mark the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. At the onset, I would like to join others in offering my congratulations to Ms. Sanda Ogiembo on her recent appointment as the Executive Director of the UN Global Compact. I would also like to thank Ms. Lise Kingo for her many years of dedicated service and vigorous leadership in the same post. I very much look forward to working with Ms. Ajiambo as she takes the global compact into its next stage, the mobilization of sustainable companies and stakeholders to bring the full weight of the private sector behind the sustainable development goals. Ladies and gentlemen, Geopolitical circumstances have made it much more difficult for the world to reach the SDGs by the 2030 deadline. Since their adoption, achieving them has been predicated on the assumption of increasing international cooperation. It has also been predicated on enough resources put to that end. Unfortunately, the reality for a number of years has been the opposite, as we witness less and less quality cooperation between UN member states. When I was president of the General Assembly in 2012 and 2013, I was tasked with steering the UN towards the establishment of the 2030 Agenda. My job was to help member states launch their negotiations to agree on a list of SDGs and to help develop financing, monitoring, and reporting mechanisms. It took many months of intensive work in New York just to agree on a format for the actual negotiations. Eventually, they got off the ground, and ultimately the 2030 Agenda was adopted on time, a few years later. But I can tell you from my personal experience that even then, the mood amongst the diplomats in New York was not exactly one of altruistic teamwork. Ever since, diminishing multilateral cooperation has remained the prevailing trend, laudable exceptions notwithstanding. 
And unless these trends are reversed, it's difficult to imagine that the world will achieve the SDGs by anywhere near the 2030 deadline. Now, I don't want to sound too pessimistic because I still think there is a way forward, a way for the world to get back on track. And I think the global compact, the private sector, can help generate the momentum we need to catch up and build the world we want. Ladies and gentlemen, the reactions of nation states to the COVID-19 pandemic has assiduously exposed numerous weaknesses of the current international system, which has already been tormented for years by a number of disconcerting trends, like dysfunctional multilateralism, the absence of global leadership, hastening rivalries, downgraded diplomacy, economic alarm, social discontent, and environmental degradation. Instead of reforming our multilateral institutions, we've let them grow frail from neglect to the point that some of them are perceived now to be simply unfit for purpose. Just as one example, which in our present context is more than just an ordinary example, even before the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, the World Health Organization was unable to meet its funding targets. Even at the height of the pandemic, it couldn't, and it still can't. So just ask yourselves, if the WHO cannot fill its budget now, when the world is being ravaged by the pandemic, then will it ever? What worse calamity needs to befall the world for that to happen? Of course, the WHO is far from perfect. Nothing created by human beings is. But it's the only such institution we currently have. And it could be far more effective if it were funded properly. We witnessed attempts to politicize its work, which wasn't terribly helpful. The effects of this, however, could have been mitigated by a number of states stepping up to lead the charge of humanity in responding to the coronavirus. Unfortunately, no one really did. In sharp contrast to 2008, when the G20 was created to respond quickly and forcefully to the onset of the global economic crisis. The events of the past few months tell us something we don't like to hear, and that is no state or a group of states has the will to effectively take up the mantle of global leadership. And that's why my friend Ian Bremer is right. We live in a G0 world. This is the first time in centuries that we have an evident vacuum of power in world politics. And no one is trying to fill it. No one wants the job. We unfortunately live in an increasingly leaderless era the world over. And the onset of the COVID-19 did not reverse this trend. To the contrary, it hasn't even entrenched it, but it has actually quickened it. Ladies and gentlemen, it's hard to believe that this reality will not shape the efforts to recuperate from the consequences of the pandemic and in turn affect the commitments to fulfill the SDGs. Calls to mobilize concert and international action will continue to face populist resistance, as well as growing disinclination to martial solidarity. Moreover, the trend towards deglobalization looks likely to remain, triggered in part by the onset of high-tech bifurcation led by the world's two most powerful states. Many global compact participants have already felt the effects of this decoupling. And this brings me to the all-important question of SDG financing, that is money, money that is needed to effectuate the transformation of our societies, our economies, and our relationship with nature. The fact of the matter is that humongous resources are being channeled elsewhere. Over the past few months, literally trillions of dollars have been borrowed and spent by governments all over the world 
in order to avoid immediate economic collapse. Trillions more will be spent on the actual recovery. And two things seem likely if current trends continue apace. First, most governments will allocate most of their resources to kickstarting their own economies. International solidarity will not be a strong factor, and long-term strategic thinking will take a backseat to the quick fix. Second, and relatedly, we can expect further relegation of the 2030 agenda to the back burner of government's priorities across the globe. Ladies and gentlemen, the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, which is headed by my former mentor and advisor Jeffrey Sachs, has been tracking SDG implementation since the 2030 agenda was adopted. Right before the onset of the pandemic, the SDSN confirmed what a number of other studies had been telling us. Not a single country anywhere in the world was on track to fulfill the sustainable development goals by the target date of 2030. In late June of this year, SDSN and the Bertelsmann Stiftung jointly released their flagship Sustainable Development Report for 2020. One of the foci of this eye-opening report was how the coronavirus pandemic was affecting the implementation of SDG3, entitled Good Health and Well-Being. Its verdict was hardly surprising. The impact was deemed to be highly negative. The report went on to draw attention to the fragile state of health and prevention programs across the world and emphasized that the role of public health systems in disease prevention and surveillance will need to substantially increase to prevent further waves of COVID-19 and future health crises. It also pointed to the negative impact on SDG 1, that is poverty, SDG 2, food security, SDG 8, the economy, and of course, as the G17, multilateralism. This pandemic has had numerous other adverse effects on the SDGs. Vulnerable countries and population groups, including older people, people with preconditions and refugees, are disproportionately affected by the short-term and medium-term consequences of the crisis. This will surely result in growing inequalities, undermining progress towards the achievement of SDG 10. It can also be expected to undermine progress on SDG 5, gender equality, because a growing body of evidence suggests that women are disproportionately hit, including through labor market disruptions and increase in domestic violence. And of course, SDG 4, education, which tends to affect populations that are poorly equipped with digital technologies. So we can say that the coronavirus pandemic has negatively influenced in a comprehensive way the entire 2030 agenda. Ladies and gentlemen, during my term as president of the UN General Assembly, as well as on many other subsequent occasions, I have strongly advocated for enhancing the role of public-private partnerships in achieving the SDGs. And I'm a strong believer in the role of PPPs to help develop and distribute COVID-19 treatments and vaccines at global scale. This is becoming even more important given the onset of vaccine nationalism, with states engaging in fierce competition accompanied by finger pointing and scapegoating, as well as by political pressure on pharmaceutical companies to cut corners and deliver results at dangerously unrealistic speeds. We know that vaccines developed in certain countries have already been questioned for not having followed the standard safety protocols. But at the same time, we've seen that research labs and pharmaceutical companies in other parts of the world are pushed by their governments to edit the rule book in order to compress the time it takes to develop, test, and manufacture an effective product. We've also seen how some R&D efforts have favored newer vaccine technologies or riskier processes that have never before been used in human beings. And we've seen that older but established methods are receiving less attention and funding. 
Meanwhile, by the time these remarks are broadcast, more than 30 million people will have been infected and approximately 1 million will have died across the world. These are staggering numbers. So it's no wonder that we all hope for a vaccine to appear by the end of this year. But in the history of medicine, no pandemic ending vaccine has ever been created in less than four years. And research on a COVID-19 one has been going on for merely months now. So even if we somehow have the process to two years, we're still looking at the middle of 2021. And this leaves aside the question of mass production and global dissemination, not to mention equitable pricing. In this time of geopolitical locomotion, it seems like wishful thinking to expect nation states to put their differences aside and cooperate at maximum potential. My hope, however, is that the global compact can become a world leader in getting the private sector to come together and establish a set of voluntary industry-wide guidelines and procedures as we move closer to finding a vaccine. The Global Compact is uniquely placed to do this since most of the world's leading philanthropies and pharmaceutical companies are part of it. So here's what I propose. Number one, Global Compact participants should work together to help ensure that manufacturing, packaging, delivery, and distribution all get up and running. This includes making sure that supply chains can flow unimpeded, especially cold chain, and even so-called ultra-cold chain methods, if that's what vaccine protocols end up requiring. That's going to be a massive effort on a global scale. And right now, no one, with the exception of very few private endeavors and philanthropies, are doing much about it. The Global Compact, however, can and should help encouraging its big pharma participants to join with leaders in other industries and organizations like UNICEF, Doctors Without Borders, and the ACT Accelerator, for instance, in planning for what is likely to make D-Day look like a walk in a park in terms of the logistical complexities involved. Number two. Global Compact participants should encourage the pharmaceutical industry to agree on a common vaccine pricing structure, whether at cost, indexed to per capita GDP, or some other way that ensures developing countries are not discriminated against. This would build on the work of initiatives like the WHO's COVAX scheme and CEPI to ensure equitable access. Number three, to encourage Global Compact big pharma participants to agree on how to engage with governments to ensure that vaccine dissemination is public health driven. In other words, that they present a common front in terms of insisting that priority is given to at-risk groups across the world like health and social care workers. This would surely reduce the number of infections and deaths and shorten the pandemic's duration once a vaccine is found. Without a doubt, the Gavi plan is both a good model and a good start, but one that the Global Compact can help make even better. In short, by partnering with the existing initiatives, the Global Compact can encourage, in the context of the pandemic, common standard setting that is ethical, equitable, and in line with the SDGs. Ladies and gentlemen, doing just these three things would constitute a delivery of global public good of immeasurable value. So it's definitely worth doing for its own sake. But I say that it could also reinvigorate the entire 2030 agenda. Through its example, it could catalyze public opinion and governmental action to prioritize the fulfillment of the SDGs. Now, I'm not saying global compact leadership on the pandemic vaccine issue could somehow magically overcome multilateral dysfunction or stem geopolitical rivalries. 
But I am saying that it could reopen the door to getting recalcitrant stakeholders to reprioritize sustainable development. If the Global Compact can show that applying the SDGs helps the world overcome the COVID-19 virus, then maybe the set of these 17 holistic goals can help us alleviate other challenges that are inherently global. Right now, I'm afraid the momentum has faltered and enthusiasm has waned. In just five years, we've gone from asking, how can we best get this done? To saying 2030 agenda is too hard, it's too ambitious or too expensive. We hear skeptics reminding us that it's not even legally binding. As we all know too well, no penalties or sanctions are mandated in case of obligation. But I say, precisely because it's a voluntary endeavor, the promises that were made are more weighty and solemn. I still wholeheartedly believe the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development is a grand moral covenant for humanity, and that the private sector, in this case, Big Pharma, can and must act as a global alleviator of global suffering. The 2030 Agenda still represents humanity's best shot to provide for a more inclusive type of growth and more equitable societies for all the nations of the world in full respect of the limits of nature. And that's why I still think that this is far more significant than just a simple agreement between states. Ladies and gentlemen, the SDGs are about our solidarity and responsibility to one another as individual, national, and corporate stakeholders. They are about an historic decision to cease destroying the very basis for future generations to prosper wherever they may live. The deeper truth, therefore, is that the 2030 Agenda is, after all, binding upon us all. Not only because our leaders gave their word, and because as citizens of our respective countries, we must hold them to their promise. It is binding because the alternative is no longer unimaginable. The spread of a mortal disease no one wants to lead in eradicating. Right now, however, passing the buck, taking no responsibility, blaming others, acting selfishly. Sadly, that's our reality today. I'm sure we can do better. And the Global Compact can help us do so. Ladies and gentlemen, in Macbeth, Shakespeare describes a world almost afraid to know itself, a world in the down throes of twofold pestilence, disease caused by nature, compounded with disease through misrule. In a time of plague, the king's ineptitude grows alongside his insecurity as he loses all facility to act with prudence of forethought. The very firstlings of my heart shall be the firstlings of my hand, the king laments pathetically. His selfish, short-sighted effort at self-preservation is transformed by fibrility into self-destruction. The king's time ends in tragedy, while the play ends with a hope for renewal. The world of today bears a disconcerting familiarity to the one stage by Shakespeare. This pandemic presents us with that sort of Shakespearean hope, an opportunity for a do-over, a second chance to seize again the opportunity of the 2030 Agenda. Instead of squandering it yet again out of fear, reticence, distrust, and credulity, or whatever else may be holding back our governance. This may be the moment for the private sector to stand at the vanguard of the SDGs, to show that it is possible to lead, and to show that leadership produces results that momentously advance the common good. Ladies and gentlemen, at the end of Macbeth, newer comfort is announced by one of the characters. Wanting to erase the pestilence from memory, he hopes the recovery can be swiftly achieved. Certainly, we would be well advised to temper our expectations of what constitutes success.
And I must caution, even if we do everything in our power and to the best of our ability, a panacea is by no means right around the corner. But without some tangible success, our world is in danger of descending further into covetous rancor, having learned nothing, gained nothing, and forgotten everything. And I, for one, think we must do better than that. I thank you very much for your attention. Hi, this is Richard Edelman. Our firm has been doing reports on trust for the past 20 years. The trust barometer has become an important measure of confidence in business, government, NGOs, and media. We have made three studies uh, since January on COVID um, because it has so scrambled the world order. And this is the most recent. It is about the return to the workplace and fears um, of coming back. So I just want to give you some context. Um, in March, uh, we found that uh, it was expected that business would step up and be responsible for the health of its employers, and also that employers were a key part of the information dissemination. We found at the end of March that, in fact, brands uh, were expected to be uh, an important part of the fight, uh, that, uh, in fact, they should offer lower prices and more access um, to those who are out of work. Further, um, we got a interim measure of uh, business performance um, in in April and found that in fact under half of the people in the countries we surveyed felt that uh, business was doing well or very well um, in terms of protecting its workers. Also that CEOs <clears throat> were actually at a very low level in terms of demonstrating public leadership, that they had in fact ceded the ground to government, which importantly um, we saw that the table was completely rearranged um, between January when for the first time business was the most trusted institution to the end of April when government became the most trusted institution in the world for the first time. And in fact, that gap between business and government completely flipped and reversed uh, because it was a problem of the size of World War II. Only government had the ability and the resources necessary to fight this horrible disease. So. Coming into uh, this survey at the end of August, we went into seven markets, uh, some in Asia, Europe, and uh, North America. 3,500 respondents uh, across those markets. And the timing of the field work was August 23rd to August 26th. So here's what we find. Point one, there is real fear about returning to normal life. More than two thirds of our respondents say that they think that there will be a second wave, a new outbreak in the fall. So what they're doing is they are no longer ready to resume normal activities. The only things that they're prepared to go and do are go to the grocery store. Fewer going to restaurants and very few uh, are willing to take trains, airplanes, buses or subways. And this is particularly important about the return to workplace because if you can't take mass transit and you live in a city, you have a very few options. So I want to particularly point out some very low numbers uh, in Western markets especially, but big fears in the US, UK, etc. about subways. Uh, in the US also traveling on train very low. Very few people want to take uh, ride shares, Uber, et cetera. Um, and so we're basically confining ourselves to where we live. Now, the return to the workplace. So the key finding is only half of those we spoke to believe that the office space is safe. And actually, under a third say that they are prepared to enter a corporate office in the next three months. I'm in our New York office today. We are about 10% of our normal capacity. And this is similar to other cities around the world. The UK, France, and others are, are ahead of us uh, in this, but the US is really lagging. 
Here's a problem. There are too many voices speaking up and it's confusing the marketplace. There's no single authoritative source of information about return to work. Pretty well equal numbers for health authorities, state and local government, federal government, and the workers themselves talking horizontally, peer to peer. So when there's no real clear way to go, you get frozen and you just stay with what you know, which is stay home. We find that there's a big expectation that employers will impose multiple precautions. In fact, in most of the markets, it takes between three and four of these actions, mandatory use of masks, here's mine, social distancing, reduced density on the floor in the office, checking people's temperatures, and limiting non-essential travel. In short, the workplace has to change in a fundamental way for us to have any faith. And in some markets, especially the US, some of these safety precautions are deeply politicized. On mandatory use of masks, Democrats are one and a half to one, 63 to 44 over Republicans about the willingness to do that. On many of the other things, distancing, et cetera, there's more consensus. But masks are a sign of freedom versus a sign of responsibility. In the meantime, employees feel very comfortable working from home. They're totally happy to continue working virtually. They think that employers um, will not penalize them from staying home, that they have the option for the foreseeable future. And some big companies like Google and others have reaffirmed this and said, we don't expect you back until next summer. But we need to communicate and continue to set expectations. Note that uh, multinationals are doing a particularly good job of that and that middle and lower management has a lesser opinion of this than upper level. The information infodemic. News organizations are the primary source of information across most of the world. However, I want to point out that there's a big difference between being the first port of call and being the believable port of call. So, Contrast this slide to the next one. You see that health experts, national health authorities, global health organizations are much, much more believable than the major news organizations. And there's a problem in that. In fact, over a third of people tell us that they have to see a story three or more times in different news outlets in order to believe it. Whereas with doctors, for instance, the first time or the second time, three quarters of people believe what the doctor says. So there's an information mismatch between supply and demand. We also find that social media is actually a deeply problematic component of the information scene. You'll see that within the West, about half the people say they will never believe information about COVID if it's the only place that they see or hear it from social media. So this is contaminating the environment and um, that's a big problem. Vaccine receptivity. We were shocked by these statistics. There's real work to be done between now and when a COVID vaccine is available because otherwise we're gonna have a lot of people refusing to be vaccinated. Take a look at this slide. Would you take a government approved, no cost vaccine if it were available? How many people say no? Well, in France, 49%. In the States, 42%. In Germany, 38. The UK, 33. We have a big problem. It is a lack of confidence in the speed and the methodology being used in the clinical trials. There's a sense of rush to judgment and a lack of belief. In short, we find that women are the hardest, also people of lower income stratum. It's not as much an age issue. And as women are the gatekeepers of the household, we have a general problem. In the US, where anti-vax is particularly strong, we find that 
This has a certain political aspect, but much, much more a racial aspect. So people of color, half say that I will not get a vaccine. Women, half say that they will not get a vaccine. These are big numbers, and we have to use the next three or four months advisedly in explaining, persuading, inch by inch, to get people off of their fears. Vaccine receptivity relies on quality information, trust in an influential source. And that is not, ladies and gentlemen, going to be government alone or the health authorities alone or my employer alone. It's gonna require all three. I want you to look at the we'll never believe information part. On those who say that uh, they will never believe information about um, COVID vaccines, 56% say that they'll never believe information from government. 63% say they'll never believe information from health authorities. We at least have a chance through the prism of the employer to get quality information forward. So here's our sort of four point plan about how to build trust during COVID. We have to overcome this stay put mentality. We have to slowly but surely through staggered uh, times of starting work, cleansing um, approaches, persuade people that trains, buses, and subways are viable. We also need to talk about the workplace itself, that in fact, companies have reduced the density, required masks, incent incentivized people um, to take their temperature at home uh, or, or do it at the workplace and, and make sure that non-essential travel is, is eliminated. Third, we've got to deal with these information mismatches. Uh, for example, between the source of information, mainstream media and social, and the belief in information, which is doctors and health authorities. We need to find a place in between. It could, for example, be companies own uh, web information. And lastly, vaccines will not get to trust in the COVID response without a good reaction to vaccine. But this is circular. Tell people how we're testing. Tell them which groups are being tested. Give them the response rates. If there's a problem like AstraZeneca and Oxford, be transparent. And then show progress. We can't have this be like a Greek tragedy where the hero comes down at the end from heaven. It's not like that. We have to overcome legitimate fears on the part of women, communities of color who have a problematic history about vaccination. Um, and lastly, we have to persuade uh, those who have big skepticism about government, that in fact we are telling the truth and that this is something that we need to do as a community and do it together. So I hope that this has been an inform, uh, information that uh, you can use. Uh, I'm very much hopeful that uh, we can uh, get to a good place uh, in this world in the next year uh, with a vaccine, with people coming back to the workplace. And I thank you for listening. Thank you, Sandra and Liu Meng, for inviting me to speak at the Uniting Business Life around the 75th United Nations General Assembly. I am pleased to see Amina Mohammad, our UNSDSN Chair, Paul Paulman, RJ, International Chambers Chair, and Majin, and fellow Space Transformers, Fiona Reynolds and Hala, among the impactful virtual community for our better world. With the COVID-19, the raging fires and climate crisis, along with the unfolding social, political and economic tsunami, the traditional context of decision-making must change. The failures and inadequacies of our systems across so many sectors, most obviously health, environment and education, but also business and the financial sector are drastic. 
These disruptions have led WEF to talk about the need for a great reset. It is a call for global stakeholders to work together to shape a revitalized future system that is cohesive, sustainable, and resilient. The challenge is to frame the role of business that delivers a better world. This requires a shift in the collective consciousness and for the system to see and sense itself. This also requires a re-evaluating and a redefining of our business as well as mental models. Not all profit is equal, not all finance is equal, not all technology is equal. I believe that there are principles and values for building a sustainable society in the region and our world where economy and business are interconnected. In Chinese language, people use fan rong to describe riches and prosperity. The character that make those words ming at the top, sensitivity to the systems at the bottom, and the rong is the harmonies with the roof over people. It's a home where we have to be balanced with the trees below and also the sky above. Our beliefs is that harmony and sensitivity as human beings within an ecosystem has been what is meant by the forefathers on prosperity. That is also the Balinese philosophy, the Trihita Karana or the President Jokowi calls it the triple pathways to happiness. So these are principles that secure harmony and balance across people, ecology, and the spiritual. As if by divine intervention, prosperity and happiness are aligned with the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals. I'll show a video this is happiness with SDGs. To solve the world's problems, the United Nations and world leaders launched 17 goals called the Sustainable Development Goals to make for a better and happier world. The first 10 goals are inclusiveness, humanitarian, social, and people problems. The next five goals are about sustainability and nature. Finally, goals 16 and 17 on peace and partnership are about spiritual values. Having harmonies with people, nature, and the spiritual make the world a happy place. This is the SDG Pyramid to Happiness. Uniting business for better world brings to the fore the imperative to bring happiness to all by using its entrepreneurial and innovative spirit to drive meaningful change. The breathtaking bamboo space with natural skylights is the three mountains in Kurakura Bali. This sustainable space was the first tallest entirely bamboo architecture building in the world. Three Mountains is a gathering place for our United in Diversity Bali campus and Vizic with Mari Pangestu when she was still minister in Indonesia. It is home to the UN Sustainable Development Solution Network and Tsinghua University Southeast Asia Center. Over the past week, we held the Rich 70 Tsinghua Southeast Asia Cloud Forum, inviting many change makers to reimagine. We also envisage with Indonesia the concept of ecological red line, the social green belt and peaceful blue road. Over close to two decades, we have had the privilege to partner with MIT Sloan, Peter Senge, Otto Sharma, John Sturman, who are students of Jay Forrester. Jay is the father of system dynamics and invented the radar and RAM memory chip, which technology he outsourced to IBM, enabling the digital revolution. We believe 
the world needs a system revolution and a system reset. First, in our Kura Kura Bali project, a 500 hectare development in the heart of Prime Bali, we started with a system chart to explain our value cycle aligned with the Balinese Hindu values of Sri Hita Karana. Our vision was to have a creative campus at its core, an ecosystem for innovative businesses, enterprises, global partners across sectors with a vision for a better world. The invitation is to co-create a virtuous enterprise, financial and technology model that solve ecological, social and spiritual challenges, all underpinned by high quality education and technology infrastructure. This is even more pressing in COVID times, where the social digital divides can make or break societies. This program on Happy Digital Acts will be launched and invite participants across sectors to focus on three things, design thinking, computational thinking, and system thinking to prepare leaders for the Great Reset. Trihita Karana Sustainable Development Forum was founded with the honorary patronage of the Indonesian president. And we launched the Trihita Karana Roadmap on Blended Finance with OECD and global partners at the forum around the IMF World Bank annual meetings in Bali 2018. Blended Finance, if applied effectively, can scale up additional commercial resources through the strategic use of development or philanthropic finance to meet the SDGs. This was incorporated into the G20 Leaders Communicate in Osaka and will be pursued in the upcoming G20, ASEAN and other platforms. In particular, we believe in uniting diverse stakeholders and take them on a journey this model teaches us to look beyond the symptoms and into the structures, the root causes, the mental models, ultimately discuss, discover the source and reach a collective awareness in order to make that shift. Imagine the space. We invite all of you, business transformer, government transformers, transformers of academia, arts, civil society, youth, and indigenous communities. Please join us in this journey. everyone, I'm Helen Hai, Head of Blockchain Charity Foundation. Congratulations on the successful opening of Uniting Business Life, and I'm honored and excited to share the great potential of blockchain technology in the advancement of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Can blockchain technology advance human rights, provide access of food and humanitarian aid, can come back climate change, addressing issues of identity and human traffic? The answer is yes. We are now facing a unique period in history, where in the moment where we pivot from an industry economy to one defined by technology. Perhaps the most exciting solution in technological economy we are talking about is blockchain, a technology that creates a new chapter of social contract, provide true freedom of value and help solve the issue of trust, transparency and inclusion all over the world. It offers opportunity for all community members to own their identity and be part of the community governance. 
It provides all parties and participants in general with a layer of traceability and global transparency, which inherently promotes behavior and responsible use of resources. It guarantees precision in the surveillance of actions through the use of smart contracts and validates the action that occur within blockchain. All those benefits make blockchain the fastest, most economic, resilient, and fair technological solution for all parties committed to UN SDG. So the question is, now how will this technology be used for each SDG? Let me give you some examples. Blockchain technology has been successfully proven to be the best practice in the field of sustainable development, especially in the humanitarian aid and environment. For example, blockchain technology innovates charitable giving's approach and making donations fully transparent and accountable by enabling end-to-end -end donation and eliminating intermediaries. Blockchain-based carbon credit and green bonds enable an efficient green financing system that is sustainably powered by reliable and precise incentives and impacts could be precisely monitored and treated. You might ask, how would Binance Charity advance SDG? Binance Charity has demonstrated strong leadership in shaping the blockchain industry into powerful drivers of sustainable development. And we always stand in the fronting line of global emergency and fight against poverty. Since 2018, Binance Charity has been handled almost 10 million US dollar worth of funds through blockchain community, through which is successfully supporting more than millions and beneficiaries in underdeveloping countries. In 2020, Binance Charity supported the foundation of United Nations Global Compacts Sustainable Infrastructure for the Belt and Road Initiative to accelerate SDGs action platform and we committed to support the 10 principles of the UN Global Compact with respect to human rights, labor, environment, and anti-corruption. And most importantly, in the COVID-19, we have been spending millions of dollars to supporting more than 25 countries across five continents to supporting lives of millions of people. How other private sector could and should engage them? While blockchain is still in its exploration and infancy phase, as the technology progress, we look forward to collaborating with all parties in private sectors and together explore social values and responsibility of new technology and advance the global, sustainable, common shared future together.